let's cultivate our motivation. <clears throat> and although we may be one individual among seven billion on this planet, and although we cannot change the whole world, our life is important and we can have a profound impact. So let's cultivate a motivation of love, wanting beings to have happiness in its causes, and compassion, wanting them to be free of suffering in its causes. And include in our motivation that through what we learn here, may we progress on the spiritual path and may we become more and more capable of making increasingly positive contributions to the welfare of all living beings. And so let's have that be our motivation for what we're doing today and the motivation for the rest of our lives too. Okay, so what I usually do with this book is I read a little bit and then comment on it. Yeah. By the way, the people in the young adult uh, group, uh, Russell will be coming Tuesday to speak to you. So he's, he's really quite good. So this is about establishing compassionate habits. <clears throat> As with learning any new skill or habit, it takes purposeful effort to establish compassionate habits. Okay, so the spiritual path isn't just, you know, you sit down and empty your mind of all thoughts and whammo, bango, you change and now you are the most compassionate person in the world. It's not like that, okay? We are very much creatures of habit. And so we have to, you know, consciously cultivate the uh, qualities that we want to have. They aren't going to just instantly uh, appearing, appear. As much as we can daydream that wouldn't that be wonderful, that isn't a cause for that to happen. Okay. We deepen our capacity for compassion by repeatedly reminding ourselves of the desire to help others and ourselves move towards happiness and to free them from suffering. And we also continually uh, um, habituate ourselves with compassion by reflecting on the causes of compassion, which are, you know, thinking of the unsatisfactory experiences and gross suffering of other living beings as well as cultivating an attitude um, that sees other living beings as enduring. At, not enduring, endearing. <laughs> okay. Well, they sound, they sound alike, don't they? So we want to see them as endearing. And the way we do that is by reflecting on... Uh, the fact that we've received tremendous kindness from them, okay? Both in this life, and for those of us who believe in past and future lives, in previous lives, and in future lives also. And also just opening our eyes to, uh, to how much we receive from um, society <clears throat> and all the strangers uh, around us who's work um, we depend on to stay alive and to thrive. 
okay? So we have to keep reflecting on these causes of compassion and in that way in, increase it, increase them and increase the compassion. So uh, as we do this, eventually compassion begins to manifest effortlessly. Okay. We can be creative in finding ways to be compassionate. We can establish a routine using common daily incur- occurrences, such as stopping at a red light or sitting down on the train or bus to pause and connect with compassion. So uh, this is a very nice thing to do in your life, you know. Each day consciously have certain things that make you stop and come back to your compassionate motivation. Here at the Abbey, uh, before we do any new activity, we stop and cultivate our motivation. So just like we did at the beginning of this session, um, you know, with our morning meditation, we cultivate the motivation. After breakfast, we have a, a short community meeting. Again, we cultivate our motivation. Uh, the people in the kitchen have their own motivation that they cultivate. Uh, and so we do this all throughout the day, constantly coming back to our motivation, uh, sometimes reciting a verse or uh, you know, or sometimes people just leading us in in a motivation, and that's very effective to bringing you back to what your purpose is in life. Because yeah? other, otherwise, we so easily get distracted by other things, and our motivation, our good motivation, can degenerate to, um, well, how can I get the most out of this for me? You know, and so to prevent that happening, we have to, you know, really be conscientious about it. So, uh, as Russell suggested in here, you know, every time you stop at a red light, instead of going, oh, gee, how come I didn't catch the green light? Uh, you know, this is slowing me down. Come back and think about compassion. <clears throat> every time your phone rings, before you pick it up, just think, I want to be kind to the person on the other end. One thing that I think is quite uh, important is when you go home every day, before you enter your home, stop and come back to your compassionate motivation and remember that you're going in and you're going to be with the people that you care about the most. And I say that this is very important because sometimes the people we care about the most, we take for granted and we treat in the most awful ways. Okay? Uh, you know, you just walk in the house and it's just like, oh, I'm so exhausted. Uh, bah, 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 complain, complain. You know, bring me something, hold a drink, do this, why isn't dinner ready? You know, whatever it is, okay? But to really stop and think, oh, I'm going to be seeing the people I really care about. And so I want to be kind to them. I want to create a good family. You know, especially if you're going to see your kids or your grandkids. And, you know, we all know how small kids can push your buttons, not to mention teenagers. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, just to set our motivation again and, and reaffirm that it can be very, very helpful. Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, he's a Vietnamese teacher. He uh, has the practice of they ring a bell, and when uh, they ring a bell, then everybody stops and, you know, has three breaths. And so that's a very good practice, you know, if... And, uh, something is getting heated. I've heard of stories of uh, the children of the parents who go to Thich Nhat Hanh's things. When the parents start going at each other, the kids will ring the mindfulness <laughs> bell. <laughs> so mom and dad have to stop and breathe three times. <laughs> okay. Uh, one uh, person told me that uh, their, their, you know, mindfulness signal is every time she hears, Mommy! <laughs> you know that. <laughs> you know that tone of voice, yeah. 
daddy, daddy. Uh, you know, okay, that's the time you stop, you set your motivation, then you respond to the child. Okay, so I think those are very good suggestions, you know. Or every time you're, uh, uh, you you know you get a signal that you're getting a text message or a, or an email or something. Stop and remember your motivation. Or every time before you turn on the computer or the phone or whatever it is, stop and cultivate your motivation. It really can make a very big difference. We can mute the sound during the first commercial of every television program and take a moment to connect with a compassionate thought or exercise. Whoa, <laughs> that's optimistic. <laughs> Actually, when I went to visit... Uh, when my, when my parents were still alive and I went to visit, uh, the only time we could talk was during the commercials. You know, I had to uh, take the thing and mute it so that we could actually talk because the television was on all day and uh, if I didn't mute it, there wouldn't be much conversation. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, Russell continues. Uh, my friend and colleague, Paul Gilbert, suggested a good one for folks like me who sometimes put our hands in our pocket, carrying a small stone or object to remind us to bring compassion to mind every time we feel it in our pockets. Those of you who are working in the forest, you reach in your pockets and there's chips of wood. Yeah, so... You can use that as your mindfulness signal. We can get in the habit of bringing a compassionate thought or intention to mind just after waking up in the morning in what we in compassion-focused therapy circles call compassion under the duvet. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So the, they, they say, today I will be kind to one person I don't know. Or, today I will not criticize anyone. Wow. Okay. What I recommend from a Buddhist viewpoint when we first wake up, you know, to think, today I will not harm anybody as much as possible. To, today as much as possible, I will be a benefit to others. And three, today I will continually cultivate my bodhicitta altruistic intention. Then get up and do your morning routine. I like this one. Today I will not criticize anyone. Yeah, all the people around me should definitely have that motivation. <laughs> it might actually be good for me to have it too. I don't know. <laughs> For compassionate practices that take a bit... Oh, I thought it was falling off. <laughs> I was going to grab it. <laughs> For compassionate practices that take a bit longer, we can schedule them into a day planner, like every other task we value. Yeah. So that's good. If you're having trouble um, setting up a daily meditation practice, write it into your calendar. Okay? Six o'clock every morning, I have an appointment with the Buddha for a half an hour. Okay? Then, you know, the night before, you remember, oh, I have an appointment with the Buddha. I've got to go to bed in time so I can wake up. I'm not going to stand up the Buddha. Yeah, and not show up for an appointment with the Buddha. I don't recommend that. Yeah? <laughs> then, you know, or if you have your appointment for the Buddha in the evening, then if somebody calls and says, oh, let's go, you know, watch the horse races, hmm. um, then you say, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I have an appointment. Yeah? And then you sit on your meditation cushion and you have your appointment with the Buddha. Yeah. You're not lying to the other person, and you have a very good reason not to go. 
Okay, the idea is to find ways to bring compassion into your everyday life, moment by moment, to weave compassion into the fabric of your life. Okay, um, another way to do that is when you read the news or listen to the news, okay? So, you know, read something or listen to something and then stop it and, you know, put, press pause and then cultivate compassion for the people that you're reading about. Yeah, because people get themselves into the most amazing messes. Yeah, and uh, to stop and really think, oh, may I have compassion for those people? The compassion does not um, dissolve their responsibility for the messes they create, but it helps us to avoid being critical and hateful towards them and instead realize their minds are overwhelmed by afflictions and uh, in that way have compassion for them. It uh, makes the news much easier to take in. Otherwise, uh, you know, it goes in in all the wrong way. When we engage in a particular type of thinking or behavior, there are two effects. The first is the immediate effect of the thought or behavior. In the case of thinking uh, compassionately, the effect may be to shift our perspective on a situation, provoke uh, different emotions in us, or inspire us to behave in helpful ways. So just stopping, cultivating compassion, you know, it'll have an immediate effect on how we speak and act towards other people, and also on our own mood. Yeah. Because we can look at one situation either with a very critical mind, which makes us unhappy, or we can look at the same situation with a compassionate attitude towards the people involved, you know, wishing them to be free of suffering. Because when they're free of suffering, they won't be doing those things that bring those problems. Okay? So that's the, the first effect, the immediate effect uh, of generating compassion. The second effect gives us the ability to transform our lives in the long term. Every time we think or act in a specific way, we make it more likely that we will think or behave that way in the future. We are creatures of habit. Okay. Over time, we can deeply embed compassion into our minds, establishing habits and abilities that are strengthened bit by bit through repeated practice. Okay, so this is the method, you know, of filling the bucket drop by drop. Yeah, and we do that, and eventually the bucket gets filled. This is the key to transforming ourselves into the people we wish to be. This sort of change occurs through small steps repeated over time. Think of a skill you've developed gradually with repeated practice. Playing a instru uh, musical instrument, cooking, gardening, woodworking, working with electronics or cars, using computers, yeah, painting, any, any kind of skill that you have, sewing, it's all developed through repeated practice, isn't it? Yeah. I, do you remember learning to type? Yeah? I remember high school typing class. Oh, my goodness. I still don't know how to type numbers without looking at my fingers. Um, but, you know, that was definitely something that you just have to practice again and again and again. Remember learning to drive a car? Again, have to practice again and again. Okay, so all these things, um, you know, we don't learn instantly. So it's the same with attitudes and uh, emotions. We have to practice them. Okay. In each case, our abilities develop with practice. 
so that things with which we initially struggled eventually occur automatically and effortlessly. Strengthening and deepening our natural capacity for compassion is like developing these skills, except we can practice compassion in almost any situation, no matter where we are, and we were born with all of the equipment we will ever need, our own minds. Okay. So if you're going to learn woodworking, you have to do it in a certain situation. You, know, you don't carry your tools around with you. You don't carry your, well, some people carry their computer around, but you don't practice typing everywhere you go. Okay, But practicing compassion, we can do everywhere, because we don't need any kind of a uh, special physical thing that we that we lug along with us, um, you know. It's just a matter of changing, putting our minds on that topic. Okay, this process also plays out in our brains. Every thought, sensory experience, action, and emotion and behavior in which we engage is reflected in a corresponding activation of cells called neurons in the brain. Every time we think in a specific way or perform a certain action, a pattern of cells lights up in the brain. When these patterns are activated, changes occur within the cells and in the connections between them, gradually making it easier for that pattern to be activated in the future. When a certain pattern of cells is activated, activated many times, it becomes very easy for it to be activated in the future, so that when something triggers it, it can seem to happen automatically. So do you see in your own lives that there may be certain emotional patterns or emotional reactions to specific things that just pop up in your mind like this? Yeah? One word of criticism, instantly we're angry or defensive. Okay? We see one beautiful thing, instantly we want to go buy it or eat it or whatever it is. Okay? So this happens just out of habit. So uh, in a Buddhist way, we talk about the mind having habits and everything we do putting um, like seeds or imprints on the mind which make it easy for us to feel or think or speak that way in the future. For scientists, yeah, then they talk about making a neural pathway that makes uh, that feeling or uh, behavior come, you know, very naturally. So we really are creatures of habit. What's nice is if we can cultivate a good habit, you know, or put it this way, the more we cultivate a good habit, the easier it becomes. So at the very beginning of our practice, it's going to take some effort. Yeah, If you're used to getting angry all the time whenever somebody says something you don't like, it's going to take some effort to like, okay, i got to step back here, breathe, calm down, the world isn't going to end because this person said this. You know, it's going to take a lot of effort. Um, but as we practice it, gradually it's going to become easier. And the thing that would be very nice, you know, through this practice, is when it comes time to die, then automatically compassion comes to your mind. Wouldn't that be a nice way to die? Thinking, you know, having compassionate thoughts when you die. Yeah, instead of, Oh, what's happening to me? This is scary. Oh, you know, to be able to just, you know, you change, you put your mind on compassion. You put your mind on the, you know, with care and concern for other living beings. And then you die with that kind of, uh, you know, attitude. And you go on to your next life with that kind of attitude. That would be really nice, don't you think? Yeah. We had a friend who just died a few years ago, a Buddhist practitioner um, in Missoula, Montana. And uh, I talked to one of the friends there and said that, uh, he said that when Bob died, there was just this certain kind of, ha he died in his sleep. Uh, just, you know, like a half 
the beginning of a smile on his face, you know. And this particular man, Bob, was all, you know, every time I saw him, he was very cheerful, um, extremely kind to others. So he had that kind of uh, habit in his mind. And that's all a personality trait is, is a habit. Okay? We don't have fixed concrete habits that or fixed concrete personality traits that we can't change. Yeah, what we call a personality is just an accumulation of habits. So we can change our personality by changing our habits, you know. So I think Bob probably died with that, you know, kind of optimistic, calm, uh, or cheerful. You know, he wasn't necessarily calm, peaceful, but he was very cheerful, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully he died with that kind of attitude, yeah, which I think would be really nice, yeah, rather than if we're very habituated uh, with anger, yeah, or if you're like me and complaining is your, your favorite activity, then, you know, death comes and it's like, oh, God, this is not at the right time. <laughs> you know, you know, this is just really inconvenient, you know. <laughs> I have some things I need to, I need to write this book, you know. So, like, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> okay. So if that's your habit, you know, then that's what's going to come up at the time of death, okay? Which won't be so good. <laughs> okay, this process explains why repeatedly familiarizing ourselves with compassion makes it easier for us to be compassionate. It also explains why it can be so hard to break certain habits we'd rather not have. Okay, we're all familiar with the failure of New Year's resolutions. Okay, so don't make them. <clears throat> okay, but rather try on a day-to-day -day basis to cultivate the qualities you want. Okay, rather than making fantastic New Year's resolutions and then forgetting them by January 2nd. Okay. Um, because these old neural pathways are so well-worn, we can find ourselves engaging in those same old behaviors before we're even aware of it happening. So it's important to be patient and kind with ourselves as we gradually work on establishing new neural pathways and stop reinforcing the old ones. Okay? So, you know, don't expect ourselves to be perfect encourage ourselves, be patient with ourselves. I wonder, you know, how would it be if with the people you live with, if they're, again, you know, because we know each other very well when you live with somebody, um, and they're starting on one of their habitual things, yeah, instead of saying, oh, there you go on one of your, your habitual things. Uh, if you said, oh, uh, your neural pathways are acting up again. <laughs> yeah. Would that enable us to, to uh, hear what the other person is saying better if they just said, oh, you're, you know, t check up on your neural pathways. <laughs> yeah. You know, because usually, you know, somebody says something, it's like, mm. But if they're not talking about us and they just talk about our neural pathways, then, you know, I wonder, I'll try that sometime. <laughs> okay, so Russell again says, <clears throat> here he's speaking personally, that he likes to use the example of a path in the woods. Imagine I've taken a nice walk through the woods behind my house every day for the past 10 years or so, walking the same route every day. Over time, you can imagine that a path would wear in. The repeated walking would create a track, and it would be easier to walk on this track than in uh, other places in the forest, as the shrubs and undergrowth would be worn away there. When it rains, where would the water run? Down the path. Our brains work in similar manners. 
thinking and acting in a certain manner over time wears in packs of activation in our brains, so they eventually light up almost automatically. This is good if we're studying for an exam. We know that if we just review that definition enough times when studying it, it will spring forth from our minds effortlessly in the exam. Speak for yourself, Russell. <laughs> I don't know, I can go over a definition many times and it's gone. Okay. But it can be challenging when that well-worn path corresponds to a habit we want to change, just as, such as the tendency to speak harshly to others or even chewing our fingernails. Yeah, it's hard to break those habits. However, once we understand how this process works, we can use it to our advantage. Imagine I got tired of the path I'd inadvertently worn into the woods because it created negative consequences, say the water running down into my backyard when it rains. To change this, I need to do two things. First, stop walking down the original path. Okay, so if what you're doing isn't working, stop doing it. Sounds easy. Yeah, makes sense. And yeah, try it. <laughs> yeah, and this is where we need, you know, persistence and patience with ourselves. Okay. So, one is to stop down, walking down the original path, and second is to start walking down a new path. This is easier said than done. And if I don't make an effort to be aware, <clears throat> I'm likely to continue walking the old way out of habit. Uh, but by choosing a new path that is more to my liking and paying closer attention when, I, when beginning my walk, over time I'll form the habit of walking the new path. This is a gradual process. Meaningful change seldom happens overnight, not in the woods and not in our minds. After just a few days, the forest doesn't really look much different. But over time, the new path gradually becomes more and more worn in, and the old one grows over. <clears throat> Eventually, we hit the tipping point, and the new path becomes the path of least resistance, where we automatically walk, and now when it rains, the water runs where I want it to go. Okay. So we've seen this in our woods. You know the path um, down Compassion that's below the burn pile? A couple of years ago, we were working in that area of the woods, and uh, the path had been very overgrown. We worn it completely so it was open, with, and you could walk it very easily. Once we finished working in that woods, in that area, then few people were walking there, this year, it's very overgrown. Okay, so what this means is, you know, we oh, we not only have to stop walking the old way and walk a new way, but we have to keep walking the new way. <laughs> yeah, because if we don't, it could very easily get overgrown again. It works the same way when establishing the habits of thinking, feeling, and behaving compassionately. It can be slow, it can be slow going, and require a good bit of effort in the beginning. Yeah, the beginning is always the hardest with these things, I think. We may do the practices, but not really feel compassionate. Okay, yeah, I know, those people are suffering. What's for breakfast? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Those people have been give, those people have been very kind to me. Yeah. They give me cereal, but I wish they would give me the kind of cereal I like. Um, you know. So it. Uh, uh, we can say things, but you know. Uh, we get easily distracted. We don't always feel it. You know. And, and that's very common, of course. You know, we learn things by first saying the words, 
and familiarizing ourselves with the topic and then slowly through that we begin to understand it and integrate it and bring it into our hearts and make it our own. Yeah, I was reading one book recently. Somebody um, did a study. Yeah, I should look up what the study was. But it was something that uh, along the lines of what they say, fake it until you make it. Okay? And I think it was about um, smiling. And if people, uh, f you know, initially make themselves smile, then gradually they get used to smiling. And they've also found that smiling uh, changes your, you know, the, your neurons in your brain so that you actually feel happier, which I think is interesting. Yeah. So you kind of, at the beginning, make yourself smile, and then gradually it becomes, uh, you know, you just feel it more, and it starts to change your mood and uh, your approach to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see that, uh, yeah, with, with so many things. You know, if we let our mind go south, and we just, it's like, Maybe something happens that we that we don't like. If we really ruminate about it and think about it over and over and over again, we just increase that habit and we get more and more, you know, depressed or angry or whatever it is. So it's these kinds of things where if we just train ourselves, you know, to d direct our minds to a different topic, it can have a big effect. Okay, we may do the practices but not really feel compassionate. We may inadvertently walk the old path, gossiping, judging, or snapping at another person, or shaming ourselves, only realizing we're doing it later. The key is to keep going, reconnecting over and again with our intention to be compassionate and reorienting ourselves towards this goal. This means learning to catch ourselves while we're judging or shaming and repla replacing those judgments with compassionate, understanding thoughts. It can also mean apologizing for our harsh words and renewing our commitment to speak more kindly in the future or to not speak when we're irritated. Okay. So it's interesting to look at some of those habitual patterns in our mind of how we talk to ourselves. Yeah, because we tend in this culture to be extremely self-critical. Yeah. And so we often shame ourselves, we criticize ourselves, we put ourselves down. And we do it so much that First of all, it just becomes our M.O., and that's how we are. And also, we do it so much that we think it's other people who are shaming and criticizing us. And they're not saying, boo, we're just doing it all to ourselves based on how they say good morning. Okay? So they, they do some simple action, like say good morning or, you know, please buy some peanut butter or whatever it is. And, you know, we have this negative habit. And, oh, they're criticizing me. Oh, again, I'm a failure. Look at me. They're shaming me. They're telling me I'm incompetent and stupid because I forgot to buy the peanut butter. You know, and we, we go into these, you know, spasms of, of uh, self-criticism thinking that the other person's making us feel that way when we're the one making ourselves feel that way, you know, just through the force of habituation. So what Russell is saying is, you know, we need to become very astute, you know, and have a very strong introspective awareness so that when these kinds of thoughts start coming, we immediately notice them. Yeah, and we stop and we say, oh, there's my mind going down the wrong path again. 
let's come back to a more realistic view and a kinder view of this situation. Yeah. And that's how we, we start changing. And the more we do that, uh, the more peaceful our mind becomes. Yeah, especially if you're someone who likes to ruminate. Yeah, anybody here like to ruminate? Yeah, around and around. And around. They said this, and you know, then you analyze it to death. Yeah, they said this. They why did they use that word? They didn't use this word. That must mean that this is what they really meant. They were implying this and that, although they didn't say it directly, and that they always do like that. So I'm sure they're really, you know, have it out to get me, and you know, again, and we ruminate. Ah, oh, the path to misery. Okay, it's just all made up garbage in our mind. So you know, the more we can be really uh, quick to identify this, and then just say, "Okay, I gotta press the pause button." Yeah, I'm not running that video again. Because yeah. we all have our own little videos that we don't run, that we run. Yeah. Yeah. There's the how dare they talk to me that way video. There's the poor me, nobody understands me video. Yeah. There's the I'm so brilliant, but they don't appreciate it. Appreciate me video. Yeah. There's the I'm right and they better realize it video. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, our days are just uh, spent, you know, play one video, play the next. We've watched them all 10,000 times. Boring, but we keep watching them. Yeah. So we have to press the stop button. Yeah. Oh, boy, what I do sometimes during retreats, you know, because people get so very caught up in this, is I have everybody write down the storyline of one of their videos. You put them in a pot, and then everybody picks out somebody else's rumination storyline. And then when you start getting distracted, you have to ruminate on the other person's storyline. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's so boring. You know? It's like, Oh, God, I have to think again about what this so-and-so's brother did to them 20 years ago. <laughs> I'm sick of this, you know. Why can't they get it together and forgive their brother? So their, their problems, their ruminations are so boring. But ours, oh, we watch those videos again. And again, you know, let's refine this scene and embellish it. You know? Crazy. <laughs> okay. This isn't easy to break those habits, <laughs> but we can be confident in the process. We know if we keep walking that new path, it will wear in over time. Knowing that it takes time, we can be patient with ourselves. The payoff is worth the effort. It's exciting and satisfying to see compassionate thoughts and behaviors we've practiced finally appearing automatically in our lives. Yeah, when you see that start to happen, it's like, wow, this is nice. Yeah, and that really increases your confidence. In our compassion-focused therapy anger groups in uh, the prison, I've seen men who were serving decades-long sentences for violent offenses proudly and excitedly share stories of responding to provocation with kindness and understanding rather than aggression. This is how we change, and it's worth the effort. So Russell uh, also runs like these uh, anger groups at Airway Heights Co uh, Correctional Center. This is where some of our monastics uh, go for the Buddhist group, but he runs an anger group there. 
And uh, he's told me some of the stories from that. And it's true, you know, some of the guys, they, they really, they're highly motivated. The people who go to that group are highly motivated to change because they're sick of being angry and they see that their anger is what got them, you know, in prison to start with. And so they really try to practice what he teaches. And he says, you know, sometimes people will come in with an and tell the story of an incident that happened in that last week where they were actually able to control their temper and, you know, not get involved in a fight or a quarrel with either an inmate or a, a staff member and how rewarding that is for the guys when they see that change in themselves. Okay, so then there's a reflection here. So this is the homework to do for this chapter. Consider, it, consider a compassionate habit you'd like to cultivate. Can you think of one? This may be a way of thinking or approaching a situation or a considerate behavior you'd like to turn into a habit. It may involve bringing empathy into your interactions. For example, by taking a moment during your conversations to pause and consider how the other person might be feeling. Come up with a plan to integrate this habit into your life. For example, you could plan to pause and consider the feelings of the other person during the first conversation you have when you get to work with uh, when you get to work every day the idea is to find a way to practice this way of thinking feeling or behaving over and over so that it gradually becomes a well entrenched habit okay so we have a few minutes um, for questions and comments well, um, I don't want to. So much of what you said today was very helpful, so I don't want to nitpick. But. But. <laughs> but. So, so, this notion of fake it till you make it um, always kind of struck me as this kind of pop psychology thing that never really sat well with me because, well, fake it till you make it seems this kind of fake. So, like, <laughs> to me, in my mind, like, it's just reinforcing the neural pathway of being insincere, actually. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe for myself, maybe there's, I feel like there's a better way of doing it, but um, just practice, I guess. But I guess that's what that is, but it still seems a little bit yeah. weird. No, I, I know what you mean, because I had that same kind of reaction. Like, yeah, you're just being insincere and being phony to the other person. Um, so uh, two comments regarding this. One is to start working on your motivation rather than the behavior. Yeah. So, but if you start working on your motivation, then your behavior is going to follow along. Okay? But other people say, they've done studies, that if you start with your behavior, then your motivation will change. So it seems that it may go both ways. And I don't know, maybe in some people, it's, I know for me, it usually is first change my motivation, then the behavior. But I no, also know I can't always wait to get my motivation really clean and pure. Because if I wait that long, there's going to be a lot of litter on the path <laughs> from all the messes I've made. Yeah. So sometimes just, uh, you know, I may not feel so kind, but I do know I should keep my mouth shut. Okay. Uh, you know, and I think that's, that's fine. You know, I might feel like blasting somebody's head off, but I know that if I do, it's only going to create more problems. It's not going to help me. It's not going to help the other person. So, you know, I stop the behavior, and then when I sit down on my cushion after that, then I really work on the motivation. 
because there's more time to work on the motivation then. Yeah. But if you just say, oh, you know, I feel like blasting that person, and if I don't, I'm not being my genuine self. Yeah, then, boy, you know, we're not going to have many friends left. <laughs> so, um, I'll give you a scenario of what happened this morning driving up here. Um, very simple scenario. I driving past a pickup truck with a big NRA sticker on it and immediate anger rises up in me. Um, just how, how do I work with that? Well, maybe the person who's driving it, that's not their truck. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's one thing. Uh, it, what it's reminding me of is uh, Brian Stevenson told this story in his book. Uh, what's the name of his book? Just Mercy. Just Mercy. Of going to a prison and coming in the prison parking lot, and there was one truck with all these right-wing stickers all over it, you know. And when he went into the prison, the guard that he had to talk with was the owner of that truck. Okay. And that guard gave, hassled him no end. He's a lawyer, and he was the lawyer for a certain uh, inmate in that prison. The guard hassled him, made him do a strip search, all sorts of things, really hostile. Okay. Uh, Stevenson kept us calm, but, you know, he was very aware of what was going on. Then, as it happened, the later on, after some time, the, uh, the inmate, they were uh, having a, a new, I don't know if they had a new trial or an appeal or something, and that guard had to uh, drive that inmate, you know, there. And on the way driving there and driving back, he heard uh, that guy's story. Yeah. And it really touched his heart because one of the reasons he had hassled Stevenson so much was because he was the lawyer for this good-for-nothing inmate, blah, 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 scum of the earth kind of thing. But when he really heard that man's story, and there was something about a milkshake. I can't remember what it was that this man just wanted a milkshake. And so the guard stopped and bought him a milkshake, you know. Anyway, the, the point of the story, even though I didn't tell it accurately, is that through encountering a real human being, the, this prison guard's mind really changed, yeah. And because so often when there's an absence of really getting to know a real human being, we create a stereotypical image in our mind, put that person in that box, and that's all they become. Yeah? So that's what you were doing. You know, even if it was that guy's truck, you know, the minds made it so that the whole meaning of his life yeah, is that he's an NRA member. Yeah. That's a little bit narrow. Yeah? But I can see in my life where I've done that, where somebody has harmed me, and it's like I hold a grudge, and I think that's the whole value of their life. You know, one behavior they did for five or ten minutes. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's really not realistic on our part. So I think analyzing the situation, pulling it apart, seeing how we create that image and that thought and thereby lock ourselves in, you know, when you, s you can really study that me mechanism in your own mind, then it becomes much easier to, to let it go. Yeah. So the thing is, if you ever pull into a gas station with that guy, stop and say hello. <laughs> yeah. And talk to them. 
And then, you know, there's a, a relationship with a real human being. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you have an NRA sticker out in your vehicle here, <laughs> uh, be careful of him. Okay. <laughs> He may want to talk to you. <laughs> uh, I don't want to just turn it into a whole bunch of examples and, and stuff like that, but um, I was wondering if you had any specific ideas about dealing with jealousy. Mm. Yeah, they say be careful of what you're jealous of because you might get it. Yeah? Um, because with jealousy... We're idolizing, we're we're making one thing that somebody else has look totally marvelous. But with everything, there's a downside. And when we're jealous, we don't see the downside of having that thing that we want. All we see is that they have it and I don't and I deserve it more than they do and I should have it. So it's, um, it's very helpful to step back and think about the downside of getting that. Yeah. Uh, years ago, I was at, living at one Dharma Center, <clears throat> and there was one woman who came, and uh, you know, she, she and her husband probably were in their, I don't know, late 40s, early 50s, and her husband was leaving her for a younger woman. And she was fuming, and she was jealous. And, and I said, Claudine, she gets to pick up his dirty socks now. You know, relax. It's not that bad. Huh? Because everything, you know, comes with another side to it. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I think with jealousy, to uh, habituate ourselves with the idea that that we all uh, have our own unique qualities, yeah. And so the the because um, the whole paradigm of jealousy is to compete with somebody, but then we lose. And if we win, then we become arrogant. Go, okay, so we go from jealousy to competition to je- to arrogance to competition to jealousy. You know, our minds are, are never very peaceful. And I think it's very helpful to to say, you know, I don't need to compare myself to other people. Yeah, I have my own talents and qualities. I have my own opportunities. Yeah, and if I had the, that other person's situation, actually, I might be really unhappy. <laughs> 